Hello and welcome back to Parenting Unpacked. You are with Dr. Siobhan Kennedy Costantini and the esteemed Dr. Kristen Summer. <laughs> oh, why I am call I you esteemed, esteemed now? Because I hold I you esteemed? in esteem. I hold you in high esteem. Oh, you're so kind. How are you going mm. more generally? Well, I did have a somewhat emotional breakdown last night as I was editing our latest episode um, to put up. I always leave it to the last minute, like until I've finished work for the day on Monday and it goes up like in the middle of the night on Tuesday for our US listeners and things like that, whatever. Um, And so like, I was like, cool, it's fine. Like I do this every time. It takes me like 10 seconds to um, edit and upload, which is also why our quality is tragic because I don't put any effort into editing it. So I apologize to everyone, but we're actually working on it. And I think our, our quality is finally getting better. But this time it wasn't my fault. Like it wasn't our mic's fault. Uh, it wasn't our internet's fault. It was nothing. It was just the recording platform just dropped half of Siobhan's audio. Like, and it wasn't like consistent. So I had to troll through the entire hour episode and like cut out certain bits because it just didn't make sense. And like we needed to put that episode up. So what was meant to be separation anxiety um, and hacks for dealing with daycare and things like that, it ended up being separation anxiety disorder only and not the actual like separation anxiety typical development stuff so Siobhan we might talk about that today um yeah by the time everyone (laughs) else is listening to this that podcast was four weeks ago so that's fine um but yeah so that was a bit of an emotional breakdown hopefully the platform we're using doesn't have any more bugs although I did record an episode with parenting translator last week and that one is not quite great right now i'm trying to fix it with the tech team so we will see what happens um but yeah we are phds in child development not technology despite the fact that i did my research in robots um so everything is still a mess (laughs) sorry so long story short you're not the greatest Uh, you could be better Um, i could improve growth mindset yeah (laughs) <laughs> not not you personally just that you, you're having a bit of a rough time and technology isn't being your friend no no riverside where we record our platform R- isn't being my yeah. friend and no one ever solves my problems on the riverside um and i don't know why service, we're still paying right? for it uh anyways this is not at all what this uh podcast is on where we no. talk about parenting not about technology i don't know what we're doing here it's in a we're in a strange does. place right now but siobhan Last week, six days ago, um, from when we're recording this, so about a month ago for you guys, it was Trans Visibility Day. Hmm. Um, And I decided that I would start championing more gender diverse creators in my life and in my platform. I wanted to learn more about it. Um, So I reached out to one of the researchers at Griffith, where I work. Um, She's a PhD student researching gender diverse identity development in children and like how we treat it and like how clinicians treat it and look at it and stuff um and we're working on this workbook together for parents about like how to raise gender positive children like because at the moment a lot of people are afraid they're afraid that if they encourage gender positivity in any like gender diversity in any kind of aspect that they're going to create um gender diverse children which folks not true um how that how that works (laughs) no, you cannot create a gender diverse child. They are either diverse or they are not. You do not get to control that. But anyways, like there's a lot of fear around it. And that's like, that's fine. Um, Because our goal is to educate them with uh, this workbook. But this workbook wasn't going to be ready in time um, because we have jobs and lives and sometimes our bodies say nope. So it wasn't ready for Trans Visibility Day. So instead, what I did was I put Molly's voice and face as a wonderful trans woman and researcher on gender diverse identity onto my TikTok platform. So I'm going to put that in here now. My name's Molly. I'm a colleague of uh, Kristen from Griffith University. I'm a developmental psychologist and I study how gender diverse identities develop um, across the lifespan but and children as well. Um, first thing I will say for parents is that uh, gender diverse kids are still quite rare. Um, in general, we find that about 0.6% of the population identifies as a gender diverse identity. That's about one in 600 people. And for the vast majority of people who identify as gender diverse, we often find that there is a feeling from early childhood or adolescence 
that we call the sense of difference. It's a feeling that they are just different from their peers or their family or their friends in some strange, unknowable way. Unfortunately for us is, um, as developmental psychologists, kids usually lack the language to articulate this kind of sense of difference in sophisticated terms. So our research in the area is almost always re retrospective due to this. What can parents do? What can you guys do as parents to ensure your kids feel safe and empowered to express this sense of difference and, you know, foster this, uh, you know, emerging gender diverse identities? And I'll, you know, introduce this as an internet friendly numbered list. Number one, I would say is don't be judgmental. If your children are expressing gender non-conforming interests or behaviors, just let it happen. Allow those behaviors to happen and those interests to happen. But also, number two, don't assume. Because don't assume that these behaviors are a symptom of gender diverse identity. As a lot of parents know, sometimes little boys like nail polish because mum likes nail polish and they really love their mum. But they might otherwise just grow out of that interest. And, you know, when they're older, they might be like, oh, nail polish. I never want nail polish, mum. You're on drugs. Sometimes little girls say they want to be boys because boys get cooler toys, which they do. Boys do get cooler toys. But this might be short-lived or, you know, not actually indicative of anything. So don't assume your child's gender diverse identity just from behaviours. Communicate to your kids. Number three, communicate. Communicate that gender diverse identities exist and that they're normal and natural and okay. And hopefully kids will then internalize these messages and internalize that it's safe to come to you to talk about this kind of stuff and, you know, address this stuff with you as their parent, as their caregiver. And finally, listen. Um, your kids will tell you if they feel out of sex with their bio sex, sometimes with words, sometimes with behaviors, sometimes through stories, you know, Sometimes we feel like we can never get kids to shut up. And if you're creating this environment, they may not, you know, they may not feel like it's something they have to shut up about. And they may come to you um, with these feelings. However, if you've done all these things and your kids don't come at you as gender diverse and earlier childhood and you think, oh, okay, they must just be cisgender like the rest of us. And then they come at you later in life. What then? First thing I say is don't kick yourself. If you did your best to be sensitive and responsive and they still wait to puberty to confide in you about their gender troubles, that's okay because gender is complicated and you're not the only source of gender messaging children are receiving during their development. Um, you may They may feel that this messaging of society at large is far more anxiety inducing than the in acceptance they may be, they may have from a parent. On the same token, creating a tolerant, accepting environment in the home may mean your kid's personal relationship with gender goes unquestioned. They may not even think about gender or feel different. If your home life is gender atypical in a lot of ways, and you're generally just accepting of different sexualities and gender expressions more generally, they might not even consider themselves to be different at all until the physical realities of their bodies changing during puberty make this real. And that's okay too. I guess my main message is if you're worried about raising ch children in such a way that they feel empowered and safe enough to express gender diverse identities to you, to confide in you, you're already halfway there. Unfortunately, however, as parents, you're just one influence um, informing how your children perceive the world. You're a powerful influence, but a singular one. You have to be open and be ready and be willing to have these conversations, but also respect that children are going to come to these feelings and realizations at their own speed, and they're going to come to you at their own speed as well. They're going to come to you on their own schedule. You can only do your best, um, and that's all we can ever ask of you. Now that we're back from listening to wonderful Molly speak all about how to raise gender positive children, not gender diverse children, just gender positive children, because raising gender positive children makes the world safer for all children, whether they're gender diverse or not. Like, let's mm -hmm. just do better. But moving on. So that was Trans Visibility Day. But I actually just put a video up this morning um, on body positivity, moving from gender positivity, positivity to body positivity. And yeah, Siobhan, do you have anything to say about body positivity before I yes. dive in? Woo! 
Ooh. Yes, I, a little. I um, it's so. I so I was raised. Got uh, five. There's five kids in my family. Four siblings. Three of four. Four. Four of us are girls. One of us mm-hmm. is a boy. Um, and <laughs> like, it, it wasn't until I was a teenager really did I realize how body positive my household was from my experience. Wow. Anyway, in that like. Yeah, and I've spoken to a little bit um, since having a child of my own. I've spoken to my mother a little bit about these things. And I've come to realize that a lot of these choices were really intentional on her part, which is bloody yeah. awesome. Um, yeah. So we didn't really have a, we didn't have a scale in our house. We When we went to the pediatrician, we got weighed. I got weighed a lot because I was a very ill child, as we've talked about on previous episodes. Mm-hmm. So I usually knew what my weight was, but it's usually because I was severely underweight. Um, and, um, but apart from like, it was never talked outside the context of medical and health. Um, Mm. and the content of my food was never really talked about apart from I needed to eat it. Um, and that Mm -hmm. we've talked about that on, on previous episodes. Yeah. But like we, the focus was always intentionally on our, um, who we were as people, our um, capacities. And, like, there were never any comments really on what we looked like. Um, If Mm. there was a comment on our hair or our clothes, it was phrased in the context of you you did your hair all by yourself. That's really really independent. Or you chose that outfit. That's really clever. Like, what a a cool combination. What nice colours. Like, it wasn't – it was never appearance, Um, which is really, really cool. And, like, um, my mum never really – spoke about her body positively or negatively um mm. and our yeah the focus was always just on our, our 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 brains and our minds and what we could bring to the picture having said that I think that my <laughs> family could definitely um have emphasized exercise a bit more and like moving your body and then like the health yeah. implications of that yeah. not on an appearance level but more on a yeah. you move your body to like be strong and healthy so that's something mm-hmm. I, I'm doing a lot more with my son. Um, yeah. But apart from that, yeah. So tell me, tell me the science of it. What have we got? Well, before we jump into the science, I just want to give a completely different perspective, which was my childhood, because yeah. hearing how well balanced your childhood was, like I have to tell you guys that not every child development PhD was raised that way. I mean, Siobhan was lucky, and it yeah. makes really sense why you're so like level headed and unbiased and like able to see the perspective of everyone all the time. Whereas I'm a chaotic toddler that sometimes yells before they think. Um, <laughs> but like this makes sense because like when I was raised, but well, when I was raised as a kid, like one, I had an aunt that every time she saw me, she was like, you're looking really skinny. Chrissy, do you do you make yourself vomit? Oh. <laughs> she used to say it all the oh time. My, oh, and my I, goodness. I know. Kristen. As a young child and as a young teenager, I was just like, no. And then, like, what I the... always, after after eating, I went to the bathroom every night and, like, because I needed to pee and I felt nauseous. We all know I have issues with food and anxiety and things like who knows where that originated? Like, I've got a theory now. Um, oh, no. <laughs> but, like, there used to be so many comments about it. And I used to get told all the time, like, you better watch what you eat because when you hit 16, you're going to be the size of a house. And then I got to, like, 16 Kristen, and I was like, fuck yeah, I got any terrible. <laughs> so oh, you terrible. poor thing. <laughs> but the thing was, I didn't have any body image issues. And it was probably because I stayed pretty lean my entire life. Like, I'm very lucky to not have any body image issues. I mean, I had issues with my face. I was very, un- like, unconfident about my face and, like, hid my face with makeup and, and a front fridge for a long time. But, like, I don't think that's relative to, like, my weight. Um, but, yeah, so I had a lot of, like, comments about my weight, comments about why I'm so skinny, Um comments about like if you're not careful with what you eat you're going to be huge and they kept saying it like my mom and my aunt and like everyone used to be like when you hit this age you're going to explode and when you hit this age you're going to explode and after you have babies you're going to get huge and I think now like it's the prevailing thought is probably like when you hit 30 you're going to get you're going to be overweight like firstly and (laughs) even if you are overweight no problem you're still a valid and fine human being you are as long as you're healthy so, so, and it's like secondly oh just don't yeah. talk about it we don't need to talk about it 
I know. And then it gets worse. And I've had to start oh. being like full on mama bear. And like my mom mm. is terrified of me now because I'm so like quick to go, that is not okay to say. And I think she's afraid that she can't say anything. And I'm really trying to work with her to be like, you can say stuff. It's so fine. But like, here's the things you can't say. And I probably need to be a bit nicer about it. But one of the things that really broke me in early motherhood was my mother seeing my daughter and her beautiful chunky legs and saying, oh no. She looks like she's got like our family's legs. And I was like, what? Like one, don't ever talk about my child's body as like a four month old in that tone ever. Don't ever say, oh no, about anything to do with my child's body. And second, like there's nothing wrong with your legs. I know that you have a like an insecurity with them, but your legs are strong and you have played sport your entire life. Even now at like 50, whatever you play sport better than me you run faster stronger harder like you have such a strong body yet you're assimilating it with something bad and now you're calling my child's body bad as well as a four-month-old baby so Mm. (laughs) very different perspective and it's probably why I'm very like adamant about the way that I talk about things I never talk about the way I look I mean I don't want makeup I don't do my hair like Although my daughter got stoked the other day when she saw me put makeup on and now she's obsessed with makeup because like, it's just awesome. so cool to her. But like, it's yeah, very I, don't, cool. I don't change my, mm, I don't change my appearance though, because I don't yeah. want to or need to. And if you want to change your appearance, you can, like lots of people express themselves that way, but I express myself differently. And it's just, yeah. And I also grew up, my mother never ate meals with us ever. Like she just didn't eat certain meals or she'll like occasionally make a salad. She'd say, oh no, I can't eat bread or oh no, I can't eat chocolate. Like, and all of those like relationships with food were really not ideal. So yeah, yeah, if you grew up in a household like that. that Yeah. 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 There's a lot of things you know that that you would like to do differently. Lots of things. And you're not alone. Like we all, like there's a lot of people and like, The problem is, is that you're not just getting this messaging from home. You're getting it from society. And when we grew up and when our parents grew Mm. up, the societal ideal was a very, very thin, sickly looking woman. That was the societal ideal or Barbie. Now, we know that Barbie lowers self-esteem, like playing with Barbie, lowers self-esteem. And it increases the desire for thinness. And children actually don't want to play with like a plus size Barbie because it's not in line with the societal standards. They don't think it's as desirable to play with. Mm -hmm. Um, So we know it's not just you, um, your family life, your home life that are contributing to this messaging of body image. Absolutely. Um, But it can absolutely start with you. Um, Mm -hmm. You're like the biggest influence in your child's life for the first, hmm, I want to say 10 years before they start looking outwardly and like evaluating themselves in relation to like, peers and magazines what age would you say that occurs to born it I mean it it it, it's not a hard line like it starts as early as um kind of four and five um yeah but you parents still remain like and the good thing is like you can be the um the the dissident against society you can be the one that doesn't agree and you can kind of be hopefully the kind of homing beacon where they can come back and say hey I heard that you shouldn't have bread what do you think and you can probably (laughs) like in that scenario the best thing is to be like what that's so silly bread is delicious and it's strong and it's a great fuel for our body so like rather Mm. than being outraged and be like what where did you hear that that's ridiculous it's wrong like just being um firm but uh don't don't take it too seriously, but like emphasize that no, like, and which is exactly what your TikTok said that that food is fuel and it keeps our body going mm. and some and it's good to have a, a nice balance of different types of food. Which brings us to yes. my, I, actually, I have a question. I saw on your Instagram yes. that there was a bit of debate <laughs> going on about <laughs> is chocolate fuel. Uh, the answer, from my perspective, is yes. Is it the kind of fuel you want to always be putting in your body? Probably not. No. <laughs> but it's still fuel in in like in the richest in the truest sense of that word will it mm. sustain you and your life yes yes if there was chocolate or nothing yes. and chocolate. the choice was to it's starve fuel. or eat chocolate you would eat chocolate because it would fuel your body and you wouldn't die so on a fundamental level chocolate is fuel all food mm. is fuel and i think that's the first like mm-hmm. let's start with that that's the first point we want to teach children is that food is fuel right 
So all food is fuel. All food is equally valuable. It tastes different. All foods taste different. Some we enjoy more, but also some we can have in smaller portion sizes. Um, and like, ugh, I used to think that triangle, like the, the health mm. triangle with like the different portion sizes was ridiculous. But now it makes a really good visual to teach your children about the quantity of the foods that you can like, that you can eat and still feel good. And it's not about looking good. It's about feeling good. If we eat this much of this food and like this much of this food and we don't get them out of balance, our body feels really good and we have a really healthy relationship with our food and we have all the fuel we need to keep our bodies going, to be healthy and strong and happy. And that's what we need to teach them about. Food isn't about the way you look. Mm. Food is about the way you feel and the way you think and mm -hmm. all the things that food does. Mm -hmm. So yeah, food is fuel. Take or at least sweets off a pedestal. <laughs> Oh, yeah. yes. And like food, I think like it's really important. And I've been thinking about this a lot um, because I'm mm. trying to wrap my head around how I would teach um, sex mm -hmm. ed and sex safety to teenagers oh, too. So yes. I've got I've got a bit of time, hopefully. Yes. Um, but uh, like food is like a really great way or like it's an analogy that I intend to use in that food is fuel, but it's not just fuel in the same way that sex is for babies, but it's not just for babies. Um, it's about hmm. pleasure. It's about connection. It's about relationships with others. Yeah. Like f fuel is one part yeah. of it, but like you don't go out to a restaurant to eat like a protein bar because that's all your body needs. It just needs fuel. Like it's that, mm. it's that other elements. Uh, and that's really important to remember is that there's social um, component and like, and mm. like real love that goes into food. Like I get filled like to the tippy top with happiness when I see my mum give my mm. um, son a Freddo frog because of the memories Aww. I have associated with my grandparents giving me Freddo frogs. And I had such awesome Aww. memories. And it's just like a little milk chocolate. It's not good fuel. It, it is fuel. It's not the best yeah. fuel, but like food is a love language. So like it's, yes, it's important to remember that these things are multifaceted and like making yeah. them black and white for our kids and having them black and white in our own minds is less than ideal. Exactly. And on the topic of connection, there's a ton of science around family meals and what they do to kids. So it's linked with like all kinds of impressive outcomes, like improved academic performance, higher self-esteem, low incidence of substance abuse, lower instances of like rebellion at all in like teenage years. So the more mm -hmm. family meals you have, the more connection and opportunities to connect with your child that you have, the less likely they're going to feel disconnected from you and want to desire to um, be uh, teenagers. <laughs> You're still going to have a teenager, but family meals and that connection um, and social interaction really helps. And exactly. we use food to do that. food is social. Yeah, exactly. Food is social. Exactly. It creates opportunities for conversation Very. and connection and discussion. Yeah, absolutely. Totally. Sorry, look at my notes. Um, no. so let's just run through a few things you can do to help your child have a positive body image. And a lot of it's got to do with you being a role model. So the first one's obviously mm -hmm. we don't talk about ourselves in a negative way. If we talk about ourselves in a negative way, we're modeling to our children self-talk that is negative and harmful and lowers our self-esteem and directs children's attention to their own bodies um and a preoccupation with them so let's talk about our bodies in terms of what they can do rather than how they look at the moment my body is really good at making milk like really good at it two and a half years in it's never going away at this point I'm going to be able to it <laughs> like that. but <laughs> my body's really good at milk at the moment my body's not so good at exercising and that's my that's my next job is to see if I can make my body healthier um to exercise um my body has more fat stores at the moment because I'm making milk because fat is good for us. It helps our bodies make milk um, or just keep warm uh, on cold winters, which is also fine. Um, and my body is happy because I've had mental health issues. It's really great that my body is happy because of the combination of pharmaceuticals and food and breathing. <laughs> um, yeah. My body is happy. So these are the things that I focus on and talk about rather than talking about the fact that I'm five kilos heavier than I was before I had a baby, but I'm not, I think I'm the same way. But anyways, um, that's beside the point. My boobs are saggier. 
that one can do. That's a true one. <laughs> my boobs are saggy <laughs> when I had a baby. But I don't, I don't point that out. Like, because why would I? At the moment, my boobs are producing milk. They're doing a good job. That's what they're doing. The way they look is neither here nor there. Do you have any examples yeah. of uh, the way your body yeah, feels I think, and um, does rather than looks? Totally. I think I having it's funny having had a having had Timo, I have a much um, better relationship with my body than I did beforehand, and it's not mm-hmm. as intentional as I would like to say it was. It's I think one of I remember having <laughs> like happens. a total light bulb moment. It just happened. Yeah. I mean, I guess I have less time to think mm-hmm. about it, um, and I have yeah. less time to care because I'm like oh, well, this is what we're working with out the door. Yeah. Um, but I think because I've, I've always, I have quite cellulite legs and a bum, lots of mm. cellulite on my bum, um, which is cool. And I've, I've never loved it, but that's just yeah. what it is. But I think the first mm-hmm. time um, that I saw like cellulite dimples on Timo's bum as like a six-month-old, I was like, oh. we match. And it made me really oh. happy. And it's so silly really but I since then I haven't even stressed about my cellulite ever and I mean it's not something that's really of stress but um like I just have given it no thought since um which was just a really beautiful point of connection for me but yeah I too have been really focusing on I've I've never loved my arms um it's just Mm. never loved how they look in photos um so and partly I think as a result I tend to wear um shirts with sleeves and dresses with sleeves like it initially like it initially started as a teenager as covering them and now it's turned mm. into a sensory thing for me that if they're not covered I feel like <laughs> physically uncomfortable so that's a, a yeah. fun level of layers that are going on um but I've like just really tried to as you say focus on strengthening and then one thing I've been doing is like turning that into using that as fuel for exercise like my arms are strong I can make them stronger So like using that as if I don't like it, I can change it. I can change my body um, by Mm. letting it work and letting it move. Um, And I think, yeah, like there's things uh, we've talked about on previous um, podcasts where I've been doing lots of running, which has changed how my body looks um, and strengthened it and built up muscles in the places that it wasn't there, Um, which Mm. I think, I mean, there's so much evidence to show that exercise helps you feel better about your body not just on the physical yeah. sense, but like in the way it moves. So that's mm, mental. Helpful. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think a way, cause a lot of people get stuck on like talking about the way they look in certain clothes. So rather than saying yeah. this makes me look fat, like think about what it is that it's making you feel. So when I mm. put certain clothes on, they're too tight and I feel uncomfortable because there's something digging into me. So if I put something on, and I turn like I turn around to go get changed and like my daughter's like, where are you going? And I'm like, I feel really uncomfortable. This part's digging into my side. So I'm going to go find something that makes me feel comfy. Um, and that's mm-hmm. it. I don't say, well, I'm too fat to fit in this. Um, I've gained too much weight. <laughs> I say, my clothes don't fit me very well right now. I'm pretty uncomfortable. So when I'm uncomfortable, I'm going to go and try something else on. And like, but you'd say the same thing about your kid when they're not fitting into their clothes anymore. You'd be like, wow, you've really grown. You're getting so much bigger. Let's try some clothes that are comfier for you. Um, mm. So you're not like as hung up on the size and more hung up on like the way that the clothes feel physically and mentally, I guess. Um, okay. So another one is maybe a bit of a like hard one to pivot because so much of our society is centered on it. And that's try not to give attention to people's physical attributes saying oh wow she's beautiful she's so pretty um you this one is really tricky like I what we can do is talk about their bodies in different ways they've got such a happy smile they're so bright they've got lots of energy wow they look really strong um yeah I don't really have any more examples right now because I'm not looking at people. What what are your examples? Like I think, yeah, like I think um, because a lot and there's evidence to show this as well, but I notice it um, when Mm -hmm. kind of seeing people talking to kids. A lot of the time, particularly with young girls, people emphasize clothing, hairstyles, um, being pretty, Mm -hmm. these kinds of things. Um, So you can still talk about clothes, but kind of do it in a more um, a way that emphasizes their 
their personality, their choices, their kind of decision-making mm-hmm. process. So not what a beautiful dress, be like, that dress is such a nice colour. Did you pick it yourself? Um, or mm. where did you get that dress? Did you help, Did like, kind of emphasise the, the kind of d- the things around the outfit rather than the outfit making someone look beautiful? Because obviously, like, that's what mm. like, sometimes some of the clothes we wear are because we like how they look. And we like how they make yeah. us look. That's so not not to minimize mm-hmm. or like say that that's not a good reason. Of course it is. Um, yeah. I'm wearing makeup today because that's I like how it makes my face look. Um, I sometimes use mm, filters because I like how it makes my face look. Um, so yeah, and like <laughs> there's anyway, there's lots that goes into this, but like kind of really emphasizing kind of the agency and decision making. And I do this with my son when he picks his own outfits. I think they're terrible but he likes them. Um, And so I'll be like, wow, you picked it all by yourself. It's such a bright (laughs) colour. It's such a different colour to your pants. I love it. Um, I love it when my daughter picks clothes because she'll end up with like a Batman tee from the boys section at Target because apparently there's still girls and boys sections in 2022. Mm. Um, Mm. And then she'll like pair it with like a gold tutu. Like, and it's just like, this is complicated and so much personality and like it is to say that you can't say you look beautiful or that's such a pretty dress just make sure that it's not the only thing you focus on like with all the things we say with praise be diverse and be specific um doesn't matter where it's what they've chosen to wear for the day or what they've like painted ask Mm. some questions talk about some attributes that make it awesome because they are a multifaceted human that experiences more than just looks yes totally <laughs> yeah no yeah Timo's outfit yesterday that he picked himself was a shirt that is way too big for him it was one of those like we did an activity and we got a free shirt it's like down to his shins and then black tights mm. so he looks just like oh, he's I wearing a shirt it. dress yeah he just needed like some mm. oversized sneakers and he'd be a cool kid wearing 90s yeah. fashion sometimes I worry that I look like I haven't taken care of my child because of the clothes that she wears <laughs> Um, because she looks a bit disheveled but I'm just waiting for that day when like someone snaps a photo of me and is like like at Dr. Kristen Summer isn't looking after her child because she's like walking around the shops with no shirt on no shoes on like her hair is chaotic child protective services (laughs) I'm I'm waiting for it because she was literally where were we walking out of SeaWorld no shoes on Mm. no shirt on her hair like she pulled her hair tie out and like my daughter's hair is like mine it's insane like it's just crazy um it's and she had like voluminous. ice cream on her face it was just it's I call it crazy I like crazy to me that's a positive <laughs> way I like <laughs> sure, to call it crazy sure, sure. but yes um it is very voluminous um so her hair is just like always in her face but she looked like an absolute like gutter child mess like there is no other way to describe (laughs) my toddler and I was like someone's gonna take a photo of this and tag me in it on social media one day but I'm not that famous yet um unfortunately um that no one is reporting my terrible parenting (laughs) in the form of dressing my toddler Oh, yeah, no. man. but anyways well Timo never wears shoes so I'm with you on that no we had to wear shoes the other day yeah Oh, <laughs> but yeah. but we had to wear them the other day because for safety reasons we were in a um a house that was yep. um a bit of building site and it's just so cute the mm-hmm. shoes fit him fine but he's so uncoordinated in them because he's used to having like mm. direct contact with the floor so he's looking yeah like he's two and a half he can walk very well but in the shoes he looks like he's just started walking it's so amusing yeah she like it, she hates them she keeps them on for about mm. three minutes and then she'll she prefers to make us carry her because we're like you either wear shoes and walk or you've got to be carried or go on the pram and she would prefer us to carry her than wear shoes because she yeah, just she, hates she's like them. perfect I've got a, a wonderful solution for this you lift me up and you take me she, everywhere I don't see how this is a problem she really has it's great we're not winning in the parenting uh no you're, you're the fool the in this situation <laughs> we really are like we're getting a my daughter's down to eight hours of sleep a night like we are we are tired like oy it's oy oy. but anyways um next one man we are talking too much stay away from diet like mm. culture um for yourself um for the language you use with your child you're not don't talk about dieting talk about the food that you use to fuel, fuel your body hmm 
I'm feeling really sluggish today. My body's feeling really heavy. So I'm going to eat some food that feels light. I'm going to fuel my body with light food rather than heavy food today. Heavy food fills us up really quickly and for a really long time, like bread. But light food, light food gives us a nice, like long lasting energy without feeling heavy uh, if we're not that hungry. So I'm going to have salad or eggs and lettuce. I don't know. I'm just pulling stuff out of the yeah, air. Yeah. But yeah, instead of talking about diet, like, oh, I need to go on a diet. I'm fat. Like talk about like what you're feeling, what your body feels like and how, what you mm. think will make you feel better. And this is going to change not just your child's cognitions about food and diet and their body. It's going to change your cognitions as well. So this process isn't just about helping your kid. You're reparenting yourself and giving yourself more positive cognitions about yourself in the world. Mm-hmm. I, think, mm-hmm. I think that's, yeah. that's my theory anyways. <laughs> no, I mean, it makes total sense, right? Like that the way you, it's all about positive reframing, which is a really um, well-established and well-supported um, psychological strategy mm-hmm. to reframe or kind of change your perspective around your own thoughts. Um, so it's exactly, it's instead of going, oh, I'm fat and s- sloppy, it's saying that I feel, I feel sluggish, I feel slow, I feel heavy. Um, yeah. Because that's, I mean, it's the same things, but it's emphasizing instead of it's emphasizing how you feel instead of your physical characteristics and how, how you look. Yeah, exactly. So I think that's all the major ones that I can come up with um, in terms of body image. We should get someone that does body image research um on here i know we know multiple people um we do we but... should talk. actually we should get a yeah. bunch of um as we we've got a bit of a list going of people we'd like to have included but if you're listening and <laughs> there's no anyone one. that you yeah. would that's all right we, it, look this is <laughs> this is a long-term project um if there's mm. someone that you would like to hear um that we um haven't talked about having on or that like that you know would jive really well with us and the kind of stuff that we do please um let us know because we um we're super open to talking to to more people and kind of broadening this conversation and and sharing this more and more absolutely and people that know more than we do because we're experts in very niched in areas and we have general knowledge on a bunch of stuff because we've been in the space for a very long time but some people have like the leading knowledge on it because they're the scientists in the area so Mm -hmm. yeah we should just defer to them so it doesn't tax our brain quite as much because i'm tired siobhan i'm really tired yes (laughs) yes okay well let's pivot i'm guessing i can (sighs) know what your um your meltdown moment might be sleep related um, but what's your magic moment? My magic moment will have to come back to because I'm thinking about it. What is your magic moment? That is so good. My magic moment, I okay, I don't have a specific, but um, Timo has been joining us in the bed. Um, so normally, so we've got a, a queen bed in his room um, and he starts, usually starts the night in his cot and then wakes and then... Um, he and I co-sleep in the bed, the big bed, as he calls it. But in the morning, um, once he's kind of gotten over his um, wake up outrage, which to be fair, waking up is hard. I'm usually outraged that I'm conscious <laughs> as well. But um, yeah. once he's calmed down from that, we go in and cuddle with um, with dad in the bed. And he's just the cutest. Mm. He snuggles up to both of us and gives us big smiles and pokes our cheeks and laughs and um, and then sat up in the middle of us and just kept gently whacking our chest saying, get up, get up, get up, which was adorable. So um, tiring because that's how that works, but it was so cute. And that's my magic moment. It was lovely. Oh, that's so sweet. Yeah, my magic moment is more just like a magical time. I don't know why, but this mm. age, this stage is just more affectionate, more intense, like holy moly. Like I didn't think that tantrums could get worse because she's already a highly reactive kind of kid. Whoa. Like I have a <laughs> like an Apple Watch and it has like the like the hearing protection app on it um, that gives you alerts oh, no. when you're in damaging sound like level. <laughs> it goes off so oh, frequently because she's so loud like my husband is already sensitive to sound like and this is just she's taken it to another level she's figured out that she can go even louder 
um, and she oh, goes no. from zero to 150. And my watch is just like, you need to stop. You need to get away from this because you're going <laughs> to have prolonged hearing, hearing damage. <laughs> But that's oh, not a no. magic moment. It's just that in amongst all of the chaos is just like so much like bliss as well. Mm. Like I didn't bond with her for a long time because of my postpartum. Like I'm talking like over a year until I started to feel like positive towards my child. And now I just, I don't know, like I show her a lot of, fec- of affection. Like I am cuddled into her even when I'm touched out. Like, it's an interesting experience um, and there's totally. a lot of positivity to it. And it might, it might have to do with the fact that um, my husband and I are now doing every night at the end of the night, we talk about three things that were good mm. that happened in our day mm. because we always gratitude like, practice. you always unload with, yeah, it is gratitude. Right. And we always like, everyone always unloads like what happened in their day. And it's always the dramatic and the negative things because our brains are kind of just kind of pivoted towards the negative Hmm. Um, and I was like, we got to stop doing this because we sound really pissed off by the end of our conversations. Um, so like we end our conversations with like three good things that happened in the day. Um, and there's almost always one, at least one about our daughter that makes us think more positively about her, which, you know, thinking positively makes you feel better. Um, and feeling better leads to more positive thoughts and attitudes and yeah, gratitude's a wonderful thing. So yeah, that was a long winded um magic you're tired it's fine yes it's fine. yes yes anyways oh, well, uh, Siobhan, anything else end on. not yes. really um i'm grateful for we you should finish I'm grateful for these conversations oh yeah oh so kind maybe we should do like a good thing that happened this week at the end of our podcast now i mean that's what magic moments are but you know anyway i was about to say don't we do that isn't that isn't that <laughs> We don't always end our podcasts with magic moments. No, we are chaotic true. toddlers when it comes to podcasts. There is no structure to yeah. these things. It's literally no. just our phone calls to each other. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't, I don't know. Um, our phone calls with but, some yeah. science thrown in that we both know already, but uh, shared for your lovely listening ears. Yeah. That have really te- terrible audio quality usually and a ton yeah, of technical it's... difficulties, but we're getting but there. But we're getting there. We're figuring it out. And thanks for joining so us. So slide into our DMs and tell us if this audio quality is any better or if we should just give up now and stop recording <laughs> stuff because we're never going to get this right. Kidding. Growth mindset, guys. We're all about growth mindset here. Uh, <laughs> anyways, I'm going to stop talking now. So bye. Bye. <laughs> Thank you. See bye. Ya. Have fun. Bye, 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 bye.